Awesome, so this is creating content strategies for WordPress, which is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, we'll just be going over a couple of things, uh, generating content ideas, and then we have some subsections there. We'll go into content organization, which is my absolute favorite thing to do. I love being organized when creating content, and then we'll talk about repurposing content. Awesome, so generating content ideas. How many people hate writing content? How many people love writing content? Why are you not talking here? Because I don't like it and I'm talking about it. It's awful. Well, I think a lot of people think uh, originally that content creation is just difficult to do, especially when you're writing for yourself. You just hate talking about yourself. You don't want to sound like a car salesman. You just don't want to write about yourself at all. And it's just very like, don't no thank you. I have to hire a copywriter, which you should most of the time if you really, really don't want to do it. However, it's not as hard as it seems. It's as easy as hard as you make it. So you really just need to break it down and approach things with a different um, mindset. And hopefully I can give you some ideas on how to do that today. So we are often overwhelmed, like I said, with the idea of creating content that we want for ourselves. Um, don't allow the roadblocks to stop you from executing the great ideas that are waiting to be discovered. We all have great things that are just hiding inside that we want to be able to write and put out for our companies, for our clients. So trust me, it's not so bad. So I'm going to help um, stimulate your brain with a made up client that we have. All of us are now content writers and we are going to write for Nacho Madre's Nachos. <laughs> this is a fake food truck and they want to go to Piedmont Park and be in the food truck night and they are a create your own nacho stack food truck. So what are three items that you would find on their homepage? Just anybody raise their hand if you have any idea of three items you would want to find on a food truck's homepage. Where they're going to be? Pictures with nachos in the food truck. Yes. Menu. And ma'am, you in the back? Logo. Logo, absolutely. Anybody else? Prices. Prices, that's true, unless you just want a sneak attack and Why wait. <laughs> Why is it not your madres? Because it's their madres. It's, their not, it's not yours. <laughs> I, you want to know why? Exactly. It's great news. So, you guys, um, you see how easy that was just in five seconds, you already knew what you needed to find on a home page. So why is it that when we approach our websites where we work with the web designer or web developer, we suddenly get freaked out about what do we want on our home page? It's not as difficult as it seems, trust me. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit about branded content. And I think branding really helps set the standard for how you approach your site, how you approach your newsletter, how you approach social media, just by sitting down and writing down what you want all of that to look like. Um, oops, I think I, okay. Branded content, uh, um, what branded content basically is, is using your brand to set the tone for what you want your content to look like. So if your brand is happy and fun, you want your content to be upbeat, you want it to be bright colors, you want to use like bright words, easy to read, you know, things like that. If you have a more, um, let's say you're more of a college, you're going to use, you know, more subdued tones, you're going to be a little bit more informative in your writing. You're not going to be as upbeat and kind of in your face. You're going to be very informational. So you just want to be able to know what your brand is, what the tone is, and how branded content works for you is that it creates transparency so people know what to expect from your brand. So everybody knows that if you go to Nike, you're going to get something that's sports related. And that's just because over time their brand message has been the same. It's been consistent. It also increases visibility. So people know when they see that bright orange and they see the swoosh, it's Nike, right? Um, it also sets the pattern for consistency. Branded content allows you to be consistent in everything you do. So if you hire someone else to work with you, they've already seen how things have been. It's easy for them to just jump in and create work for you. And then it also allows for innovative thinking. What's fun is that now Nike's been around for years, decades, right? However, they still create new things. They have new ideas, right? So having branded content allows for them to think outside the box. How can we push this brand further than we've already pushed it before? So example of that I'm going to use is Creative Market. How many people here are designers and have heard of Creative Market? One. <laughs> One person, which is awesome because nobody knows what it is. So Creative Market is an online resource marketplace. Think Theme Forest, basically. Um, it's a little bit more independent. Um, it allows you to find everything from stock photos to WordPress themes. And every week they offer free goods. They um, are very supportive of their makers. As you can see, they write blog posts just about everything that their makers are doing. They try to you know, showcase what they're doing. And today we're going to take a sneak peek or just a little idea of how Creative Market uses their brand consistently throughout all of their venues. Um, 
So keep in mind that their target market is for designers. So if you don't get it, calm down, it's okay. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> um, so this is something that they post on their Facebook. Again, creative market, it's really indie. It's kind of catered to young people. Um, and so this is just like a meme they posted on Facebook. They obviously didn't create this meme. And so it says, every designer in the world, this is your life. So if you're a designer, your life, your PSDs are basically new PSD, new final PSD, new final final PSD, <laughs> newest finalist final PSD, <laughs> new finalist final for sure PSD, and then finally my favorite, new finalist fuck this shit final PSD. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's generally like my life in a day. Like I create a lot of um, stuff, so I thought that was awesome. But they didn't create this, but they know the tone of their brand is really just like light-hearted and kind of funny, and they just want to get people interactive and also share the content. If I'm there, I've shared this, obviously. <laughs> um, but as a designer, you want to share this. It has nothing to do with them. Like, they are not, you know, promoting any of their, com their content right now. They're just saying, hey, we connect with you on a level. This is their brand message. And this is an example of what their newsletter looks like. And this is the one that they send out every week that's like, they're, hey, look at these things. Um, that's what's hot this week. Come look at it. But as you can see, it's just like their logo. The branding is consistent. They have literally one sentence. And then they allow the maker's work to speak for themselves, which is really important. Depending on you, knowing what your brand is allows you to just create things more easily. And them knowing that their brand is the designers they allow for the designers to speak for themselves. They just put their work there, and they're like, hey, check it out. So if you haven't gone to Creative Market, you can go there and get WordPress themes, um, fonts, stock photos. Just go check it out. It's nice. So um, a little bit on creating branded content guidelines, which how many people have heard of what brand content, well, brand guidelines look like. Usually you get the logos. You've seen them in your company. How do you can use a logo, how not to use it, what font to use. Um, you can also create those for your content. And to me, that um, allows things to be a lot easier. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Your content guidelines should reflect your identity guidelines, which are the look and feel of your brand. So that's what the logo, that big document you get. And if you go online, if you search um, identity guidelines, you can find um, Starbucks. Like You can find a lot of um, just large corporations. Content guidelines should include the tone of your brand, the way you approach content, and what type of contents you will be creating should be simple enough that a new employee can come in and they know exactly how to generate the content for your brand. So as you can see here, it um, offers regulations without creating confusion. So it sets guidelines, but doesn't, it's not complicated, basically. So they're saying just stay within the, this, this tone, be you know, kind of upbeat, kind of light, but like, don't go out of your way to think about it. It decreases content creation time, having um, content guidelines. So by having these already set, you're not sitting at the computer at a blank WordPress page thinking, what should I write? What should I write? <laughs> what should I write? You have these guidelines already ready to help jumpstart ideas for you. Um, it also positions brands against their tell people who use content guidelines or just have been around long enough that you know what their brand means. Um, just like a new brand. Usually they're, in the beginning, are really inconsistent with what they're posting. One day they're really funny, the next day they're really serious. So um, just be sure to know what you're doing and it'll help you position yourself among your competitors. It also increases a chance of consistency. So that way, like I said before, you're not all over the place. Awesome. So creating um, brand content guidelines, it creates the overall tone for your content. That's the you know, what you want to do is just have the tone. You want to know if you're super serious. You want to know if you're lighthearted and funny. You want to know if you're kind of witty and sarcastic. Like Comedy Central, I'm sure you guys have seen, are really consistent, especially with their rebranding, about like their commercials are really witty, their like graphics are really bright and in your face. So um, just knowing what you want to do. You want to choose the formatting. So you want to know if you want to be long-winded, you want to be short, you want to you just have an idea. Um, so like the visual style for your content. So like I said, Comedy Central is really bright. They use really bright colors. Um, so usually when you, have you hire a designer to create graphics, you say, hey, this is generally what our writing is looking like. Can you create something to match this? Um, it also helps you uh, keep a schedule in mind. So you know, say you write in your guidelines, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, that's when we post blog posts. So that way, when, when you hire someone, you, they know Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, that's when you're creating blog posts. So a challenge, um, we're still talking about nacho, nacho madres nachos, so they have a newsletter. Um, what type of information should they send out the moment their customers sign up at the truck? So they have a pizza park Friday night, and they're like getting nachos, and then what kind of information should be in that first email that they get? Yes? 
Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Nothing? Yes, ma'am. Um, no, she was just answering um, what kind of information should they send out. She was saying schedule, so that way you know where the food truck is going to be. Um, but Special. Specials, yes. I, I can talk to you backward um, after the end, sorry. <laughs> specials, upcoming specials, like if they're going to have special ingredients, so maybe for St. Patrick's Day they did like, you know, some weird green lettuce stuff. <laughs> yeah, spinach maybe, spinach nachos. Um, anything else, guys? Yeah, thank you for trying. Uh, maybe like a coupon, like come back next time you get 10% off, something like that. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, she was just saying they would post their schedule in their newsletter. It wasn't a question. She was just answering like what kind of stuff should be in their newsletter. But once we get to the end, we'll answer some questions about, um, yeah, exactly. Yes, ma'am. How often should you be posting? Yes. Anybody else? Nope. Yeah, like, thank you for coming, thank you for eating nachos, thank you for burning your tongue on jalapenos, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So as you guys can see, just again, in a couple of minutes, we already have ideas just for newsletters, which we, you know, most of you won't be writing your own newsletters, but if you are, you just know in a couple of minutes, you can just sit down and have an idea of what Nacho Madre's food truck is. You guys don't even know what color it is, like it's a made-up thing, but you have all these ideas ready to go, so don't be overwhelmed. So next we're going to talk about content organization. Which how many people like don't, like we talked about your schedule, you don't know when you're posting, you have no idea, you don't know when to get on Facebook, you don't know when to get on Twitter, you're posting like in the car on the way here, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You're posting right now during this session. Um, you have no idea what's happening, you're just all overwhelmed with all the possibilities for where content can go, how often you should put out, um, but trust me, organization, it's not that bad. Time spent on content organization is time wasted. How many times have someone told you that? Like if you sit down and you organize when you post, you're wasting time because you're not posting. It's not true. Um, creating content organization systems save time and allows for more time for creative thinking. So you already know when you're going to do something. Now you can spend the time that you were thinking about posting things. Now you can think about what you want to post. And you can be innovative and you can be ahead of your competitors just because you're spending that time being creative versus should I post at 1 p.m., should I post at 2 p.m., should I post right now? Um, <laughs> that's very stressful, like it's a very stressful way to live. You don't have to do it. And you can also have tools, and I'll be talking about tools you can be using right now that allows, to po allows you to you know, post in advance so that while you're here, you could be posting, but you could be paying attention to me and not actually you know, working on your work. <laughs> so um, a little bit of content by type. You know, there's mostly the things that we will focus on, mostly our website, so your informational pages, what's on your about page, what's on your you know, other pages, your location page, um, and your blog, which I'll talk about a lot because I think a lot of people here work with blogs, I'm pretty sure, and they want to know, what am I doing? Uh, social media is another big like, oh goodness, how do we like, tie this into WordPress? And I'll talk about how you can do that. And then um, we won't really go over newsletters, but if you have newsletter questions, I'll be in the happiness bar afterwards, and we can talk all about newsletters. So the biggest thing is categories, and that's the first thing you should do is categorize your content. So, I mean, that's the first thing really you set up in WordPress is your categories. And this helps set the tone for your brand. Like, everything should be the categories of what you're doing. Um, knowing the basic topics that your contents fall under, these will be your categories. So basically, using categories is for content in the WordPress blog is a key factor for SEO. Those words are what your brand is known by. So Nacho Madre's Food Truck is going to be known by Nacho's Food Truck Restaurant Atlanta. Those are the things that they really need to focus on. Um, Mexican, I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> Not only will the categories help you with blogging, they will be useful for your overall content creation. So when they want to post something about events, which is something they will be at often, they know that they have the events there. So they can sit down and write all of the content about their upcoming events, maybe in one week. They can sit down on like, so even one day, honestly. They sit down on Sunday and they write down about every event they're going to be in it in advance and they say, hey, on Monday we're going to be here, on Tuesday we're going to be here. And they schedule those out in WordPress so that way they don't have to worry about it later on. So knowing what categories you're going to have helps you generate content. So what are your categories? Again, they're five to seven overall words that you can categorize your content into. Um, categories should be main things and then themes, and then using tags further expand upon these themes. So your category should be like your main things. Um, 
And then using tags, like, which you will do, you know, if you're blogging especially, you don't want to use things like Easter Sunday as your main category. That should just be a tag. It, it'll be every year, but you don't want it to be a category. You want to focus on the things that you want people to find you for when they Google you, which is why you should make everything you do SEO friendly, especially your categories. Awesome. So nachos, nachos, nachos. Uh, I already like, gave you some things, so sorry. <laughs> they need to organize their content. They're all over the place. They had a website, and now they're like, oh, snap, what should I do? So what are some uh, categories, despite the ones that I talked about, <laughs> that they should be using for their blog content? Think about it, smell about it. Recipes? Yes. Food trucks? Food trucks? Yeah. Location. Location? Yes. Schedule. Schedule? Yeah, that's an important one because their schedule is going to be consistent. Not nachos. <laughs> not nachos. <laughs> everything, else. <laughs> everything that's not nachos, you can find it in here. <laughs> that's creative. I'm sorry, that was one. Nutrition. That's actually good. Um, you know. That helps people find out what's vegan, what's gluten-free, what's vegetarian, what's pescatarian, which is really important today. Um, so those are some good ideas. You guys are so awesome. See, why are you not doing this right now? Leave. <laughs> 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 okay, scheduling your content, it will change your life. I'm not kidding. It really will. Um, it increases productivity scientifically by a thousand percent. That's not true. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> it allows for opportunity for collaboration and growth. So you can build your team by scheduling your content because you can allow for more people to work in the parameters that you've already set. Um, and it also challenges you to, again, create better content because you're not, again, focusing on when should I post this, when should I post this. Um, post this. So uh, way, this is really small, I'm sorry, if you're in the back, you can't see it. <laughs> Ways to schedule your content, I'm gonna read this out. Free things, a paper planner or a giant calendar, that actually works. So if you can't afford anything, you don't wanna get on the computer, buy a large calendar, put it on your wall, and get sticky notes and post things. <laughs> um, it actually works, a lot of people use it. Google Calendar is like another thing that a lot of people like to use. It's not maybe the best tool, but again, you can schedule your content using this a Google Calendar for your site, for your blog, for your social media, and saying, this is what I'm going to post this week. You sit down one day and you kind of schedule things out. Um, Buffer, uh, which has premium upgrades, and we'll talk about what they do, is for social media. Um, Hootsuite is another social media plugin. I'll talk about another one called Social Pilot. And then the Edit Flow plugin in WordPress is another one that's free, that is amazing. Like, it's, it's pretty awesome. And MailChimp for newsletters. That's what I use. There's the thousand and one. Um, tools for newsletters, but MailChimp is what I use. And we're in Atlanta, so you should use MailChimp. <laughs> and it's premium, there's CoSchedule, and I'll talk a lot about CoSchedule that also integrates into WordPress because it is amazing. Um, so scheduling social media, Buffer, they allow you to schedule Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Twitter, and then uh, they said Instagram is coming soon. I, we just did a podcast episode, and I have a podcast where I talk about business and life, and we just talked about like what tools we're using for systems. And so that's all we did. And somebody tweeted us about another thing. And so that was Social Pilot, which I had never heard of. Uh, and so Buffer and Social Pilot got into this weird argument on our Twitter <laughs> about who's better. And so basically Buffer said via Twitter, not super official, but official enough, I guess, that Instagram scheduling will be coming soon. Um, so Hootsuite. Uh, allows you to already schedule with Instagram, so they didn't even care about this argument. Facebook, <laughs> Google+, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And I will say, I did say on this podcast, I say it all the time, I don't use Hootsuite because it was really ugly when it came out. <laughs> I'm a snob. <laughs> That's just basically, it's really pretty now, but too late. Uh, I've been in the game for 10 years. <laughs> it's, too, it's too late. I've got brand loyalty. Um, and then Social Pilot, which is the tool that I had never heard of that somebody tweeted us. But it looks really awesome. I think it, it starts as a free plan, as usual, and they have upgrades. Um, they also do Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Twitter. They don't do Google+. Plus, So I don't know. A lot of people aren't using it anymore. Either, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so Edit Flow is a WordPress plugin that I talked about, and it's currently free. And so you basically install this into WordPress, and you really can't see it right now. If you can, you have better vision than I do. Um, so it's basically a screenshot, and it has like a calendar. And in that calendar, if you can see like on the first couple of lines I have, they show what is going to be posted in the future. And so then you can go in, and you can edit custom statuses. So if you're working with a different team, they can say, currently updating this article, finished, et cetera, et cetera. So you can customize that to the way you speak. So if you're not super official and you're like, 
this will be done in a week, that could be a status. Um, they have editorial content, so you can go in and you can edit what someone else has written for you. So you can just go in and say, hey, this sucked, um, fix that. <laughs> and they have editorial metadata, which I really like because you can go in and up update your SEO, or you can have your SEO person go in and update your metadata and you don't have to worry about it. You just say, hey, I posted this article on f that's coming out on Friday. Can you go in and fix the SEO? Because I don't know what I'm doing because I don't read Google stuffs. <laughs> And then also has notifications so you can see when you log in, you go to the Edaflow page in WordPress, where you are currently or where someone else is. So if they've finished the article and it's ready to be published, it will show up on your little sidebar. It also has what a story budget, and story budget basically is just like, like all of these things basically. It's like an update like, hey, this is where we are in the, the post basically. It's a really fun word that the creators of Edaflow <laughs> decided to use. And user groups allow you to put people in specific groups. So if you were run a multifaceted blog that's talking about tech and sports and food, then you can have your tech team in one group and they can only see what the tech team is posting. You have your like, you know, food team in one group, they're only seeing what the food is posting, and then you have your sports team, they're only seeing what the sports team is posting. So that's really amazing. I really like that feature. So if you don't want to pay anything, you want to test it out and see how things are going. Yes, sir. Is there a single site uh, specific or is there I think it's single site specific. I think that's what it is. I am not 100% sure, but I can check on it and get back to you after the talk. But I'm pretty sure it's single site specific, um, just because it's a, it's a free plugin. It's been around for a while. Uh, for a while. The next one that I'm going to talk about, you actually can use it on multiple sites, um, but it is paid. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Code Schedule. And how many people have ever worked with Code Schedule? Do you love it? Yay! <laughs> I do love it. It's amazing. Um, it has all of the functionalities, what I just talked about in Edaflow. Um, put more. Um, amazing. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking about ShamWow. Like, it does more. <laughs> it includes several ways to schedule social media campaigns. And it offers analytical data, which is something that Edaflow does not do. And this is all, again, in the dashboard of your WordPress or the co-schedule um, dashboard, which is separate. But they're both, like, intertwined. They update simultaneously. So you can be in WordPress all day, do all of your content um, work, basically, and not leave your site, which is amazing. Like, who is not amazed by that? It's great. Um, so using CoSchedule, uh, you can create, and I have like three sites on my CoSchedule account. So just to answer that question, I have like my main blog, I have my company's blog, and then I have our podcast blog on there. Uh, creating a new blog post in CoSchedule is super easy. You just hit the button, and it says new post, and you're like, ah, and that screen comes up. <laughs> it offers a variety of options, including drag and drop importing of files, which is amazing, uh, which includes Google Docs integration, which is, I, I don't know why your minds aren't blown. My mind was blown when I found that out. Because I use Google Docs for absolutely everything, so that was like, ah! <laughs> CoSchedule also uh, forces you to wait to think about scheduling your social media promotion by prompting several times that you can schedule a post in the present and the future. So they already suggest times for you, of when this might be the best time to post it. So you just go down and you're like, I can post today, I can post tomorrow, I can post a week from now, a month from now, like they let you know. So you can schedule that all after you write the first post. Like it's, it's awesome. And you can connect to your social media. Um, I usually just use Twitter, Facebook. I don't, I don't think there's Instagram integration there, probably for good reasons. <laughs> they do have pictures, they do. <laughs> she knows, she's here for me. Like I feel like I put you out on purpose. So I really, honestly, you can, there's a free trial for CoSchedule. I honestly encourage every person here to go try it out if you are overwhelmed with the idea of scheduling content, just because it embeds in your um, back end of your WordPress site, and it's easy to use. Like, it's so easy. I'm serious. It'll change your life. Scientifically proven, but not really. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about repurposing content. How many people here, like, write an amazing post or have written it and they, like, never thought of it? Like, yeah, everybody just writes amazing things, especially the writers in the room. They're like, I'm putting out good stuff, and it's great right now, and I don't think about it two months from now. <laughs> um, you should be repurposing your content. Um, the myth is that repurposing content is bad. It will ruin your SEO, Google will punish you, and it will kill you. <laughs> um, that is not true. Repurposing content lazily is terrible. Um, just copying and pasting the same thing on your site 14 times is bad for SEO. Don't do that. <laughs> it's just, just obvious. Good content can, um, could and should be repurposed to um, help reinforce your brand. So you should always use your best blog posts, should be sharing those, not like every five seconds, but consistently to remind people of what your brand is and also helps people know what 
So creatively repurposing your content, honestly. Uh, strong content can be expounded upon. So content that you're creating to build more content. And if you're allowing good content to collect dust, you are wasting good content. You should always write content that should be shared more than once. So if you're writing some, I mean, not always, because there will be holiday specific things. That happens. I run a paper shop, so there are plenty of things that I can never share ever again. Um, and that's fine. But by not focusing just on the things that are seasonal, I also write things that have to do with other things that can be shared in the future. I have things that I write like four, wrote like four years ago that I just reshared, and then all of a sudden Twitter, like, they found out about it and they're really excited about it. So don't underestimate the value of your content. You are actually good at what you do. Yes, ma'am. You, yes, I do, I do. I specifically think, what she asked was, do I think about repurposing content when I'm writing the content? And the truth is I do now. When I started out, of course, 10 years ago, nobody thought about anything. Um, <laughs> like we were just like, the internet, WordPress, what? Oh, dial up, this is awesome, high speed. Um, so we weren't thinking about anything. But now that I've been in the game for long enough, you should always think about writing content that's good enough that if you can share it a month from now, if somebody had never read it before, would they find it valuable? Oops, sorry guys, I'm going so hard, I got my. Okay, so examples of creating a good, repurposing content, creating digital products. So a lot of people use their blog posts and they create eBooks, uh, physical books. I don't know if you follow any food bloggers that have books. All of those recipes are on their blogs. Spoiler, like sorry to ruin you. <laughs> um, but they, con the content is good enough that a publishing company said, hey, would you like to take all this content and put it into a book? So you need to create good content that could be republished and you could make more money off of it. It could be an e-course if you're like an informational blogger, you blog about your industry enough that you could package that information and put together in a course. Um, you should be revisiting old content and updating it constantly. So in your scheduling, <laughs> make sure you put time in your calendar to say, maybe once a month I need to go back to February 2004, 2000, no, didn't go back 2014, <laughs> uh, go through all my content there and see if there's anything that's good enough that needs to be updated. Go through, um, update links, make sure you run your link checkers. There's plugins for that to see if any of your links are broken. So you can go back and update those or just put in um, annotations that this is broken or that site's gone. Um, so just be going back to your old content constantly just to make sure everything's up to date. It will help your SEO, it really will, because you, they're seeing that you're active. Um, creating blog series is an amazing thing to do with old content. So if you have a con, like you had an idea, like I had a Facebook thing that came up and I was like, I hate Max from 10 years ago. <laughs> Obviously not. So if I had posted a whole blog about why I hated Max, but I would never have done because Apple sponsored my life, um, <laughs> you know, I could go back now and write about how I was wrong when I said, that I was in five ways that I was wrong, what I've learned in the 10 years. So longevity, being, you know, well, having your content and keep being, con being consistent allows you to have longevity, which is a big thing that I want people to know is that, because most blogs basically fail in like, I think the first couple of months, like I think it's the first two months or so that blogs just drop off because creating content is hard. And people are just like, Ugh, I don't wanna do it anymore. So if you're able to stick around, it's fun to go back and see what you thought and update it and like challenge yourself because you're growing as a person. Um, it allows you to create newsletters on the content you've posted before. So if you just create a newsletter program and you're not sharing your blogs constantly with your newsletter, you can say, hey, throwback Thursday, I'm sending out a newsletter and this is what I posted three years ago. And it's amazing. <laughs> Having lots of content, trust me, it works. Having 10 years worth of content, I'm constantly being able to share things. and. Um, it, you can repost via social media through the tools that we talked about. Um, so if you have any um, questions about ideas for repurposing content or anything else, you can ask me right now. <laughs> we have 15 minutes. Yes, ma'am. You have subscribers. And yes. You're, well, you're not reposting on your site. So don't go back and copy and paste like a blog post. And then when you update a blog post, they do not get an update when you, if they're subscribed. You don't get an update when somebody, only for new content. So a new blog post gets into your like Feedly reader or your email leader, your reader or whatever the case may be. They don't get updates when you update. Unless for some reason they're subscribed. I think that may be an option. I'm pretty sure it's not anymore. If it is, there was an option at one point to subscribe to see when something was updated. That's just if they're genuinely curious. But by default, they don't get updated if you're updating old content. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> okay, I like literally never do it. Um, but this, it's funny you say that. Uh, this past Wednesday, there was like a photo shoot of Michelle Obama for I think The Verge magazine. She was really cute. And I was like, this is my woman crush Wednesday. I had never done it and I felt like, ugh, and it got so many responses. So <laughs> those things do work. And especially for, I think um, I also manage social media for a church. I do a lot of Throwback Thursdays just because the church has been around for 20 years. And there's lots of pictures that people are interested in seeing from um, a long time ago. We have them archived, and so I do throwback Thursday. So it just depends on your brand. But for my personal brand, I generally don't do it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you ever delete content? I do. Okay. I do. I am um, 25. <laughs> so I started my blog 10 years ago. You don't want to read all the stuff that I posted 10 years ago. <laughs> so I have deleted a lot. If not deleted, I have archived it and nobody can read it's private. Uh, just gets, don't look at it. It's not good. But it, I mean, it's okay if you grow and you wrote something that was awful. If you voted for Donald Trump, you probably should go back 10 years from now when we're at the Hunger Games and go back and delete it, all the content. So I'm just saying, like... It's okay to delete things. You do grow as a brand. Your brand will grow. Like our site, like our, this is our current brand basically. And it didn't look anything like this 10 years ago. It was like hot pink and blue. We were kids. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. I have a follow up. Yes. I'm doing something like um, for seasonal, like festivals. Yes. Spring, what, you know, so every year changes. Yes. Do I go back and delete No. I would keep the old content, and especially because it's going to be valuable in like two or three years. You can go back and say, this is what we did for Spring Festival 2013, this is how we've grown, or this is, you know, so people can see how much you've grown, basically, for especially for festivals, for WordCamps. I noticed if you guys follow WordCamp Atlanta, you've seen them posting from the previous years. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Oh, you gave me the feels right now? They're very warm <laughs> on the inside. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. If you are, you have this joking side that never yes. really you never introduced it into your writing. You right. You are kind of serious. How do you do that? Does that my thought process is that's going to kind of throw some people off because you're over like, time. I feel like you, over time you slowly integrate it. We were like but again, because we started out when we were little babies and so we felt like we had to be serious in our big K pants. And so um, now I go to work camps and make jokes about Donald Trump. So mm -hmm. I just over time you just slowly add it, especially when it comes to writing, because tone is really important. And you may lose people when you want to switch. And that's OK, because your idea of what your customer or what your audience is has changed. And that's fine. Like, I'm, I've got, done a million things on my site. Like, I used to be a like creative market. Uh, I used to have resources on my site. And that's what it was. My private studio 404 back in the day had a different name. I won't say it. And <laughs> that's basically what it was. It was like design resources. I would not, and it was for free. Because I was a teenager, I had nothing else to do. So I would never do that now. People won't even know that that exists unless I'm having this conversation. Yes, sir. Do you ever swap uh, guest posts with other bloggers? Yes. Guest posting, um, if you've never done it, and this is why if you have these tools set up, doing guest posts or accepting guest posts is amazing because you've already set up what you want your content to look like. And so having a guest blogger or being a guest blogger with somebody that has this set up will make your life a thousand times easier because you know what their tone is and what their audience already is without having to do a ton of research. Which for me, when I started, guest blogging was a pain because I would have to go to their Twitter and see what they're talking about. So having people that I work with now, especially if you write for like GoDaddy or any of the domain companies here that are here today, you know that then they send you like information about being a guest poster. They have like all their rules and what they should talk about and what you're looking for. You also get paid dollar bills, which is awesome. Yes, ma'am. Content frequencies. The problem is that things are always changing. And this is where we get you know, sticky about how often you should post content because there's a bif big difference in how often you should post blog content. There are people, I don't post blog content, but like <coughs> once a week, maybe once every two weeks on Studio 404. But on my podcast that I'm trying to grow and I have an audience, I'm posting two to three, and we're planning to post three to four times a week. Teachers that I know, like homeschooling people, they post like four times a day on their blog. <laughs> and they have 300,000 plus followers. Like it's insane. I sat and talked to them. My mind was blown how often they post on Facebook every hour. So they have 24 hours of posts from guest contributors that they post, and it works. It really is hard to see, hard to know. You have to work with your niche. You have to work with it in your brand. You have to do a little bit of research within your niche to know how often to post. 
But ideally, Facebook, to me personally, should be less than Twitter. Twitter should be a bit more because it's constant, it's updating. Instagram should be less because to me, I don't want to go to Instagram and see thousand selfies of your face or your Chanel bag or whatever the case may be. I will unfollow you. What is the client view? Um, for some people it does, for some people it doesn't. It just depends on their industry, it really does. And I mean, we have clients that, um, for example, one of our clients was a drapery workroom. Nobody knows what that is. Um, it basically, they go in and they, they're basically the people who like redo everything in your home. They do custom drapery. And he wanted to post because somebody told him to post on his blog once a day. Nobody cares about curtains enough to come back to your site every day. So it honestly just depends on what industry. And if your client doesn't understand, honestly, your expertise, then you should just be like, well, do what you want. Let me know how that works for you out in a month. And when you lose all of your followers, just come back and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. I feel like in 2016, um, if, especially if it's a new client or it's a client that's been established around but they haven't had a web presence, which basically they are a new client to the internet, they should know that it takes time and consistency to build up their SEO rankings. I am not an SEO person and the SEO people that I work with at the WordPress Orlando, they have told me to never tell a client you're gonna be number one in the Google ranking systems after 30 days. That is kind of like a red <laughs> flag, <laughs> like don't do it. So I would honestly say, Set the expectations of building their um, community, building their newsletter, their list, building their um, social media followers. That should be the expectation they're looking at. And set like guidelines. So they want 100 you know, followers by this date. You being the person to research and kind of know how long it'll take to build that following based on their niche. And then that way you can say, OK, maybe in 30 days we'll see where you are. And then that way we can benchmark for the next 30 days. I don't, I don't really do that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't make promises that I can't keep, so I, I know personally that I'm, I, again, I'm not an SEO person. I would say maybe if you hire so-and-so, they may do it. And there's some SEO guys that are out here, trust me, go track them down and hire them to do SEO for you. Because as a content writer, you are not going to be as great as SEO as an SEO person. That's just, they work with the algorithms. The algorithms change every, like, couple of months. That stuff is never the same. So I just personally, I couldn't say, hey, you're going to be here because next month what you're doing may not work and they just drop you off. So I just, I would say, honestly, I would suggest to my client, we need to work with an SEO person and this is how much it's going to cost. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ideal length of a blog post, and this is, you're going to have to Google it, but I'm pretty sure it's more after 300 words you hit the benchmark SEO-wise. I'm pretty sure that's what it is because I remember I don't write, <laughs> I don't do that all the time. <laughs> but I, now that I consciously, I read that and I consciously think, okay, and um, what's great about co-schedule, I'm pretty sure, and WordPress too, they sh you can see your word count, you can see how many words you have. So if I'm only at 150 words, I know that this content was like not good to post right now, so I should come back. And think about it and come back at a later time. Yes, ma'am. I'm here in the corner. How do you um, help a client understand from benchmarking, I guess, the right. ROI of having a content writer and a blogger? Right. And again, you said it's, it's sort of industry specific how much they should be out there. Like, mm -hmm. how much does your, your customer want right. to hear from you? So it's hard to, it's really hard to justify your clients when you hire a blogger right. and a content writer, the ROI of it. it, it I mean, and that's just not just content, right? It's design-wise, it's development-wise. People just don't want to hire people. <laughs> and so you really, I mean, it's true. People really don't want to spend money on things that they feel like, especially they feel like they can do it themselves. And they say, oh, I can go in and write something. Right. You have and to really, yeah, exa and they never do. You have to really be able to build up your service on your site and in your pitch, in your talk, you should be saying, this is what, and you should have examples. So if you work with somebody before and they've like grown, you should say, hey, this person was here, this person wasn't there. Without examples, it's really hard to pitch people. It really is. And we have been designers for 10 years. And people will, and my husband and I will enter the room and you'll see him outside. He was wearing like a Batman jacket or something. I don't know. 
Um, and they will still walk right past me and they'll go to him because he looks more experienced because he has like facial hair or whatever. I don't know. Uh, it just, you really can't, like the thing about clients, especially in the web industry, especially when it comes to WordPress, because WordPress is such a, I feel like it's not a buzzword, but people think they know what it means. So you just have to have, the, you have to be, you have to breathe <laughs> and sit down and explain to them. If they don't want to work with you, you just walk away. Like it's not worth the pain <laughs> and the headaches because every time you do something, they're gonna question you on what you're doing and they wanna see physical results and they're gonna wanna see physical numbers. They're gonna wanna see like the visitors and this and that. And it's just, it's a headache. You usually like show by measuring your own clients. Yes, you yes, own yes. We sit down and we yeah. create our own benchmarking process and we say, where do you wanna be in you know three months, six months? Because I always, when I hire clients, when we work with clients, especially if we're building a brand new brand or we're updating a re-existing one, we want to work with them long term. Right. It's not going to happen. And they don't know where they want to be. Right, they exactly. Like, okay, so if I'm, if I'm your client, I say, yeah. well, I don't know where I want to be. Where should I be? How do you express to them, look, this is, this is, this is what we can do. This is realistic. This is, this is the process by which you can watch me grow and, and see why this is worth it. Usually what we do, and it's, I don't know if I can get it all in this time. We can talk in the happiness bar. Is we it, it's a long con it's a lot of con first of all it's a long conversation but it's a conversation enough where we have you know we just have results because we've had time and so honestly and it, as a freelancer or somebody that's starting out or you have your own business if you cannot sell a client to me within the first couple of like of the first hour and they're still very unsure it's probably not worth the sale it probably isn't but we can talk about it in, a d in depth because i have some things that i can <laughs> share with you and there was a gentleman right there in the back on the by the door right here you with the you yes you <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> right Depending on what she does, um, and it depends on what she is. For example, I have um, someone who wrote a list last year that I was featured on that was like, you know, 100 black tech women to follow. Basically, what they did the next year was write 100 more. They went and they looked for 100 more women and they posted it. So it just depends. If she has content, especially for some of her tips, she should just go back and say, hey, this is what I'm doing now. This is what you should be doing. This is what I said last year. This is my update. This is my tips right now. Yes, sir. She could repurpose that post just by creating a new one. <laughs> so what she can do is say, you know, go back in to update that old post and say, this is where part two is and write a new one and make sure she's using inbound links to go back to that one. There is the gentleman right next to you. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an approach. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I really don't just think about it. I don't know. <laughs> I just create words. But if you are, again, if you're starting out and you want to be more SEO friendly, you need to think about your categories and kind of go back. Don't write the same, like, don't say business and then business. This is what you should do. You should really think about how to expand upon that business and what you're talking about and how to just capture the audience in the, the first couple words of that title. That should be your, like, main goal. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's visually pleasing in a different platform. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, do that, girl. <laughs> Mailchimp has that too, but just so I newsletters. In case you don't know what your email subject should be, I use that tool all the time. Well, th yeah. I, I like you. I'm gonna carry you around with me to every work camp. Like I'm gonna like put you in the audience and pretend like I, like I don't know you. <laughs> okay, but um, we are out of time, so I'm gonna be in the happiness bar like right now. Um, you can find me again. Our company is Sevenality. I'm at Studio Four Paper, and Heart and Hustle podcast is once a week every Wednesday. Awesome. Thank you.